Hello everybody and welcome to the Celtic Unrestricted View podcast. My name is Ryan Clifford and join me in this episode. The guest episode is JP. Well, JP, um, if you're not watching YouTube, when it's out, it'll be on the Spotify. Um, current professional footballer, um, 27 caps for Scotland, currently plays with Sheffield Wednesday. We're all on the fault us, JP. Um, during the season, we've had a few um, pros and ex-pros, but... Um, I think the fact that this man's a Celtic fan, still playing at a very, very high level. I'm really looking forward to the podcast, JP. Yes, absolutely, mate. I don't think the man needs much of an introduction himself. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I've been talking about all day and I'm doing this, I think, so I'm looking forward to it. As you say, it doesn't need an introduction to, well, to a lot of Scotland fans anyway. It's Barry Bannon, Captain of Sheffield Wednesday. Barry, how's things, mate? Again, mate, I really appreciate you coming on. Not a problem, it's a pleasure to be on. Um, good, just had a few weeks of football, um, getting married on Saturday actually, so it's a, a big week for me, exciting week, a bit hectic, but um, got a bit of time out to come and talk about the good things at Celtic and um, my career, but mainly Celtic, hopefully. As, as you say, I'm a big Celtic fan, mate, so we can start off obviously with Celtic and then your career, but... Um, Obviously, I don't know how much you can speak about things, obviously, when you're playing during the season, but as a Celtic fan, how... Obviously, I know you played Celtic in pre-season last year. Um, did you get a feeler, Ange, in Celtic at that time? Obviously, you were focusing on your game and your team, but could you sense that maybe something was building then? See, to be honest, we played them, and um, the first five, ten minutes, we were all over them. Could have scored a few goals. They obviously never had all their main players playing, but as the game grew and they, they kept sticking to what they were trying to do, towards the end of the game, they were the better team. And it was that inverted wing-backs coming inside and playing centre-mid. At the start, they couldn't get a hold of it. It was Ralston, I think, coming inside. I think Welsh was playing centre-half. And we were cutting a lot of the passes out, but as they kept doing it and sticking to it, they never went away for it, even though we were net them in and getting chances. The manager was obviously adamant, no, this is what we're doing and we're going to stick to it. And obviously being a Celtic fan, as the season wore on and on, they they kind of mastered it, really, if you'd like to say that. But um, you could tell from that day that looking back now and knowing that I know now, they, they were obviously working on what they've been so successful from through the season. I think teams have found it hard to, to deal with that. Um, Wing back coming in in the centre mid, rolling out to wide, and a bad and your jaw is staying high, letting the, the, the midfielders roll out and get it, and then play them, get get them on the ball in dangerous places. I think teams have found it hard, and me watching most of the games, I think they've been unbelievable the way they've controlled games, the way they keep the ball. And it's not just passing it about, just like for the sake of passing it, they've got a real cutting edge, whereas the season before that, they never, they had the ball, a lot of the ball, but never really threatened teams. Like They never had the pace that they've got now. So I think that manager's been unbelievable. We've seen me bits it that day when we played them, but I never thought it was going to be like this. As I said, I walked away that day thinking, they're a, I probably thought to myself, they're miles off it, to be honest. But obviously, for the good of Celtic, that they, they managed to get players in, turn it, turn it around and, and win the league. I think JP, that was something that we were no critical of, but we didn't understand inverted fullbacks as fans. I was like, I don't think this is working at the start of the season. I think when I didn't think Ralston get the grips it because he was always leaving a bad uh, shot because a bad was always playing dead high. So Ralston was doing a lot of work, but he was leaving his cell shot to, to do that. And I didn't mm-hmm. see, I think it was a dynamite game at the start of the season. Um, JP, I'm sure at home we drew. But I was really I worried. Do I, was really, I was really worried. I'm thinking, this isn't working here. We're getting sold at the back. But as Barry says, JP, the more it the more I'm just sticking to his philosophy, you can see the players are just taking it to Warton. I definitely. Uh, the game at Barry's referring to we've obviously the played game at pre-season. Uh, but Barry is right, we won miles off it. But if you look at the team compared to the team that finished their season, uh, you're talking about ninth day. Do you know what I mean? It's totally ninth day between you probably look at the team at Get knocked out with Media Land in the Champions League qualifiers to the team that won the, the, the League Cup last season was totally night and day as well. And that was just a, a space of about six, seven months. And as Barry says, we didn't have all our players in Kyogo. I don't even think Kyogo was very club in. Uh, we, we didn't have Starfield. 
Carter Vickers wasn't there, Jota wasn't there, so we were miles off it. Uh, Barry started the game excellently. I think his first two touches, he pegged Sorrow, so um, <laughs> I remember that vividly. Um, so I, um, but we've always known Barry's been a good, he's always been an exceptional player, so I wasn't surprised when I seen that action happening, to be fair, anyway. Um, but no, they looked very good. They looked good. Uh, and then obviously we grew into that game. But it's a bit like your season. We just sort of grew and grew and grew the way we played because the football we've, we've played. And what I've noticed with Ange is different for Brendan. Brendan's team's played decent football. But this Ange team doesn't take, they don't mess about with the ball. So they don't like play a ball at the back line. It's like one and two touch the balls away. And everybody knows their position and what their next step's going to be. And as Barry says, when the game's played at a tempo and you're playing at that level, it's kind of hard to stop. I can understand teams and why teams in Scotland have found it very, very hard to, to combat because of the, the, the tempo and the speed of play. Plus, it helps as well the fact that Andy's broke legs and speed and everything back into the team as well, which it set his off in that, that sort of fast and furious mode, as we say. So I think, Barry, see when you played, was, was Barcraft and that in goals? I'm sure that game. He did play. I think Scott Bay, they flipped between Bain and Barkas, I think. I can't remember who it was. It might have been. I think Barkas started, actually, because I played, I think it was three twenties. I played the first 20 in the second, the, and then the 10 minutes, and then came off halfway through the second period. But I think it was Barkas, but it was night and day. There was, um, there was young boys playing as well. Um, I, uh, he played... Uh, I try to think who I played against in midfield. I think there was like Sorrow played maybe that Mackin Kerr McEnroy, I think there was a lot of young boys and then they, they brought other players on, but McGregor's and all that were up in the stands watching. So but you could still see that he wanted to play a style, even though he never had his players on the park. It was still you could still see for the that was the very first game under Ange, I think, uh, that they wanted to play a certain way and, and it's no it's no change the only thing it's changed is they've got better players in doing it and playing the way he wanted to play but you could see that he'd set it out from day one that this is what we're doing and he's obviously got better players in like Jack, JP said there then um, once you get better players in then it becomes easier obviously um, to play the way you want to play it's harder if you're trying to teach players who can't do it but I think we, the, what they've done is the bought unbelievable in the, the transfer market. Most these signings, if no oil, them have come in and, and, and made a mark. Um, maybe one or two, probably haven't. They? I don't think the boy either Gucci's had a lot of game time. Um, he's not played that much. I'm trying to think who else that's probably not really. James McCarthy. McCarthy's been in and out a bit, but I think maybe he was bought as a, a, a bit part player, to be honest. I don't know if he was bought to come in and play every game with his, his injury records, but I think when he has played, he's done well. So I wouldn't say any signings have failed. So that's what the biggest thing that he had to get right this season because there was no there was no doubt that after 30, 20 odd points behind it, they needed to bring fresh bodies in. And luckily, or whatever, whatever you want to call it, they've all come in and hit the ground running and been brilliant, really. But Barry, have you actually seen a team to recruit <laughs> as much as what they had today to more or less rebuild the full squad? Have you actually seen a team? I mean, you've played in several different sides, so have you actually seen a team be put together that fast to to then grow the camaraderie of of grow together, and then obviously more or less had to go and running. I mean, of 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 less of of no, it's not what you can say. You've just said there. It's not what you can even say. One of them was, was, wasn't, he, wasn't he up to speed or he wasn't he up to the mark. Or, I mean, any time any one of them have come in and played, they've done well. They've, they've looked party as if they've been there for about four or five years ago. So can you can you remember seeing a, a rebuild so quickly that's come in and done so well so quickly? I've never seen anything like it because even look at like your Liverpools and that under cop, it's took three, four years probably for them to get that squad together to then go and start winning things. Mm-hmm. He's like you said. You, you sometimes get players that come in and it'll take them time. Especially these Japanese boys. The game's completely different. They're here to where it's probably as they're there. Yeah. But they came in and they've just. But Hatati scored in his debut. Scored two in his first old forum. Just things like that. That's never. That's no normal. Really, you don't really see that. It might be uh-huh. up. But you don't know. But 
like you said, there's I don't know how many have signed, but I would probably say most well, all of them have come in and made an impact. Abada, Tati, Kyogo, Carter Vickers, Starfelt, Juranovic, Joe Hart. They've all been big parts of the team. Um, mm-hmm. Yakimakis as well. I know he gets signed in the summer, but every one of them's played their part and massively yeah. played their part. Matt O'Reilly came in in January. He added a bit because we were starting to struggle a wee bit. And I think he came in with Hattati at the same time and just picked the, the team up and then they went they went again. Um, yep. I think they'll need to, to strengthen again because the only thing that I was worried about last season in a few games was tiredness. I thought they looked tired and because they're playing at that pace week in, week out. I think you need bodies. Um, I know you don't want to rotate it too much, but I think obviously with the Champions League this season as well, they're, they're going to have to. So I think they'll need to bring in a few players as well this year. And then another problem you have then is how do you keep them all happy when they're not playing week in, week yeah. out? That's another problem he's going to face probably this season, whether it's the starting 11 last year picked itself really if they were all fit, bar one or two players. Like you've got Rodjick. He, when he was there, it was either him or O'Reilly or if it Turnbull back now, is he going to play instead of Atati? And then you're going to sign players, so like, maybe a left-back does Greg Taylor play? Every, there's going to be a lot of places up um, that there's going to be people fighting for and then it's about keeping them happy. That's the hardest thing probably next year when they start to sign a few more players. Yeah, and why do you think like, obviously we're, we're so significant night and day again improvements we Anthony Ralston and Greg Taylor in my opinion I would even say Callum McGregor's became a better player since Andrews came over uh, possibly even Tom Rogic uh, for what we saw last season and their performances and their stats levels but see the tiredness side Barry do you think that's mainly down to just the, the, the actual demands and the tempo that they're putting into the game? I, I met um, the Celtic boys at the end of the season in Dubai there probably four weeks ago now when we watched the Rangers game together, the final, when they get beat. I watched it with a few of the Celtic boys, Scott Brown and that in Dubai. Brilliant. And I was speaking to Callum McGregor then and I was asking him about it and it, he was just saying, training's not really long, but it's the tempo's mental, like it's high tempo. And I think today that day in, day out, and at Celtic, you're obviously in the cup competitions right to the very end, apart from obviously the champion, uh, the Europa League last season, mm-hmm. we obviously did it quite early. But the, the, the Scottish Cup and the League Cup, you're always in there to the end. So the amount of games they're playing, the amount of training sessions they're doing at that tempo, it's it, it'll catch up in you eventually. Um, if you don't get injured, then you'll tire. So I think there were certain games last season where I was watching and I was texting my dad saying, they look, they look short here. They, they, they just look tired. They still had all the ball, but they never really had that zip yeah. about them. And I think when the new boys coming in, Hattati, and um, O'Reilly, that kind of picked them back up again. Um, but then even Hatati towards the end, I thought he looked tired again because he never had a break coming for Japan straight into the season again. Um, so I think it's just for the tempo that they're getting asked to play and press it. It's so hard to keep doing that at, uh, for 90 minutes. There was a lot of talk saying first half brilliant last season, second half started to wear off. That could be a, like sometimes games they were up 3 0, you don't need to date then. Do you know what I mean? It could be yeah. there's, there's loads of factors in that. But I think, me personally, if I was playing at that tempo, you would tire um, eventually, whether it's after January or whenever. So I think that's how next season they'll need to have a lot of competition for places. They'll need probably two for every position with the Champions League and, and fight out because I don't think you can sustain that level. Of, intensity through, throughout the season without injuries or tiring. Yeah, because I found it very interesting with Angie's, he would come to Christmas time and Angie's done a presser and then he done one for the, one of the Australian media out, outlets and he mentioned about building a team to peak at the, what we would call the, the business end of the season. So the, the, the after Christmas, you're going into January, February, when the games become thick and fast and it starts to mean something in the season for the team. He, he was he was talking about both that he's more or less building them training wise so that they start to peak at that end of the season and I found that very interesting because I thought there was games at that end of the season like you say there mate that they, they were starting to tire and you could see that, that like especially the last couple of derbies 
the game in the cup and then the one at Parky, the one at one each. Because for me, you take your chances early doors, pay for games and away for him, and Aye. it's a totally different game all together. We get there singing about that shot and the next about beating us, and I find that all astonishing. Some of the outcries for that moment really day, but um, but as I say, but, but you did notice it then, like for the games, you were the team were starting to tire. So I think that maybe is something he's going to have to address personally, Barry. What about you? I think I in the old firm games, especially especially when they, we get beaten the cup, I thought. Because they they'd played in midweek, I think, in right. the Europe. I think they went to extra time as well. Yeah. And then they played us and went to extra time, and they looked the stronger team in extra time. And I was thinking to myself, how's that? Po- like, how's that possible? Do you know what I mean? Like, um, they played 120 on Thursday and looked stronger than us than on the Sunday. But like you said, I think the good thing about they've had a year at doing it, so that's the first time their bodies have went through that sort of intensity for a season. It takes you a while to get acclimatised to it. So I think this season they'll be better after it as well because they're used to training at that level now. So once you do something like, and keep on repeating it, you become better at it and it becomes easier. And I think that's the way a, a lot of them will feel this season. The training won't be as hard probably as it felt last season for them. So they'll have that side of it as well. But like you said, I think, barring a few games, after the old Firm game where we hammered them at Celtic Park, they had a wee bit of a stomp, I thought, in the, the games after that, because they were brilliant at Celtic Park that night when they the three nothing game. I right. think they looked a wee bit leggy in games after that, just got across the finishing line. But the games that actually did matter, where we had to help, help like, hold it together, I think they were they were brilliant. Um, Dundee United away, did we draw second last game? Ah, we drew one each time, maybe a big jack of Marcus. Aye, but the games before that, Ross Counties and. Uh, again, Livingston away was a tough one, might be a tough, but I thought they were brilliant. So mm-hmm. they they did they did go a wee bit, but then when they needed to do it, I thought they were brilliant. Aye, see, I see, um, down south, Barry, which obviously you've been down, down there for a while now, but um, did you realise how big Celtic is? Some of the players down there, they don't realise how I know it's a Scottish football, and but the fact that some of these players they go into like your Van Dykes and your Fraser Fosters, they all go for bigger money. And I think Van Dyke's probably the pinnacle of the example. Nobody really wanted him. They didn't think he could make it. And he's meant to, for me, he's probably one, if not the best centre back in the world. Do the, the players don't realise how big it is? Is that something you need to kind of, I don't know how, if you speak to him a lot about Celtic and Rangers uh, at your clubs, but is that something that you need to say, listen, you maybe need to try it one day? There's. There's a few it kind of know in us, but obviously we've got Callum Patterson who's played up there, Liam Palmer's kid on Scottish, but he's played for Scotland, so he kind of gets a wee bit of, he gets it a wee bit. But the English boys down here, no really, you, they, they don't really get it. You try to explain to them, but it's like Carter Vickers said the other day when he signed, until you're actually there, or you've been to a game, or, or you're playing in it, they won't know, so... They just look up here and think, oh, the league's crap. That's all you get from them, it's crap league. But Van Dyke's staying new in England, what he was doing every week at Celtic. He's just cruising through games against... I see, spoke to my dad the other day, we watched him against Holland, Hammer, Belgium. And I was saying to my dad, like, he's not even breaking sweat and he's playing against the best strikers. Even the Champions League final, I know they get beat, playing against Benzema, but he was never... He never looked flustered. He's never flustered in any game. And if you went back to when he was at Celtic Park, he was that's the exact same. He was doing the same. He was just cruising through games. So he's not really found it hard down there. He's obviously mm-hmm. it's harder, but he's probably had just harder games in Scotland when there's like a striker elbow and are just running about all, all game causing you, you problems. But they don't realise that... I've spoke to Josh Windass. He was at Rangers, obviously. I'm close mates with him. He said that it's, it's harder than people get credit for. And he was at Rangers at the time when they were finishing second and, and winning and beating everybody May sweeps. But he said it's it's there's still a good like a decent standard up there. And now you start to see it with the Scotland team as well. There's a lot of boys now. Finger Aberdeen's uh, the boy Campbell that's went to Luton for Motherwell. They're all playing for the national team now. So even if you're not circuit Rangers, I'm sure it's still a a decent standard. Like I would I would say Hibs in that they came down here maybe no 
challenge at the top end of the championship, but they, they, they're there about. It's interesting, JP Barry says that, um, that obviously, bad the Celtic fans, us, we are kind of growing into that. People who don't, until they come up here, they don't actually know about Celtic. And like mm-hmm. uh, Barry says, like Carter Burke has come up here, but he seems like Jot has. But the looks like he's going to sign obviously Celtic with the first option on him. Um, these guys have came here and they've took it like what I've absolutely loved it. And the fan base, and it just shows you that once you come to a club, Celtic, even Rangers, I know it's you don't be like, why well, speaking of Rangers, but they're a massive club until you come up here and actually see the standard of the players. And as uh-huh. as kind of mind mind boggling sometimes, I've always had a problem, mate, mate. And like you just see it. There's a lot of belief in Ingrams, I think, uh, for down the road. And it's probably just as bad up here because we, a lot, I know a lot of guys that called down the road overrated and overhyped and overpaid and everything else, but they're, they're total disregard for the standard. And, you know, I remember Brendan doing an interview before he became a Celtic manager. And the last he asked him about being linked for the Celtic job. And he mentions with Ronnie was a Celtic manager. And right. he says the league isn't so competitive up there. And then about seven months later, he done an interview for Celtic. And he says, Well, it's a competitive league, you're challenged every week. And I went, Make your mind up. Aye. I was like, Aye. Seven months ago, you were saying the league isn't competitive, and now all of a sudden it is. It's not well, until respect for up here and they go, Look at Joey Barton. Right. Exactly. We had it a bit this season, to be honest. He's screaming, we- he's screaming, he, he done a presser. When he just arrived here, screaming that Scott Brown wasn't even in the same league as him. Scott Brown totally took him to school that day. We beat him 5-1 at Park. I think that was the last game he kicked the ball for him. Nah, it's true. It's true. Except for that, or a, or a hoo-ha thing he doing. was meant to have been handbags at dawn in the dressing room, and then he was kicked out the door. We but, had it last season a wee bit, similar to what probably Celtic Rangers get it every week. We were like the big boys in that league, this league last season one of the bigger teams in the league. So you've got teams coming and try to do it. It's their cup final. I know it's like a, a cliche, but mm. it actually is because we were seeing people, we never used to, because in the championship, like it doesn't happen, like you're just the same as everybody else. When we went into League One, we were seeing teams celebrating draws and that, and like they drew against us and they're jumping about as if they'd won the cup. And that's when I started to think, that's obviously what it's like back up the road because teams are dying to beat selling Rangers. Aye. So it's no easy, there's no God given right to go out there and win a game of football. It's hard. You still need to get the job done. Um, but I remember not so long ago at Celtic Park, Front Hill scored an equaliser and they all nearly done a pitch invasion because you remember that? Aye, that was it. Like, like the death of the game and they all, that just shows you like, how much it really means to, to get a result at Celtic Park. Aye, it's, 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 it's hard. Like, it must be hard for Celtic. It's not that it's that you're better than everybody, but Teams raise their games. It's it's still a hard game. You still got to go there and 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 do the job. But you've seen yes. teams got to Man City and Man City struggle some games because it's it's hard for to break teams that, right. that come and sit and done. But that's what the, that's the problem. Celtic Rangers face every every season. Probably every season teams go yeah. there to just try and get a point. So you need to score early, otherwise it can be a long day for you. But um, you see, we listen to Simon Jordan and guys like that. Celtic would be well. Celtic would be well just pulling shuttles down and building an arm. Uh, he's going to be just he's got them because he just has total disregard for Celtic in every sort of aspect you could think of. They forget if they it. were in that if they were in the Premier League, they'd be one of they'd be the top top four teams in in, in England if they went to that league. So you made like made money. People love the fans, but one of the biggest supported clubs in the world. So you're only you're just going to go bigger and bigger, like it's yeah. just because of the money that they get in, in the Scottish League doesn't compare to down there. But if they went down there, yeah, there's a no-brainer. They'd be competing straight away. Don't right. There's loads of there's loads of boys down the road like yourself that support Celtic. Look at John Terry. There's real Ferdinand. Paul McStavis was, was his sort of idol growing up as a boy. Um, you've got Trevor Sinclair. Uh, was yeah. just up. Was just up. In fact, Ryan and. Ryan and his good pal Robert. Ryan actually missed Trevor. Robert got his photos taken with him. Ryan was in the toilet. Ah, uh, no way. What a bad, bad time in that. <laughs> but, but to be fair, I've, I was known as I was having a bad state, so I don't want you to ever do you spoke. I was, I was aware of it. Um, 
But it's I, I, I find it interesting how like, obviously because you're brought into it, you understand it, and it's just I don't know if it's just the media hype or down south, but like JP says, it does get obviously kind of disregarded. But like you say, Barry, only your career, mate. Um, obviously, we know you're from Airdrie, uh, back, back here in Scotland. She grown up, obviously, back then, was football being a footballer, you are, is that, is it your go-to, since you're younger, I want to play football, or did it just come to you as you maybe got older and thought, I'm actually quite good at this? No, well, my family were all big um, football, like, I've always loved football, so I was, same way I was growing into a Celtic, like, I had no choice, I was a Celtic fan, that was drilled in, football was as well, so, I just, I think my dad was saying I was volleying soaps around the, the living room at the age of two or three, just kicking anything I could kick. And then as I gradually get older, I was I used to come in for training and straight back out side to play football until we get shouted in late at night. Um, whenever I went, there would always be a ball. So if I was going out of the park, I would take the ball out of the park with me. Or if I was going to the shop, the ball would come. So if I never made it, then... I don't know, I'd have probably been like my dad painter and decorator because I wouldn't, even at school, I wasn't really focused at school because all my focus was in being a footballer, all my eggs were in one basket. So, and luckily I, I managed to do it. Otherwise, like I said, I'd have been working with my dad, probably helping him because I wasn't missed, I never misbehaved at school. I just never focused. So, I wasn't the cleverest because I wouldn't put my concentration into it. I would just be, remember being in school and writing. Remember when you used to write your, your world of living? I used to be doing that in the back of the books and that, instead of listening to the teachers. So just things like that. Like I was just football driven and that's all that, that mattered. And even now, like my missus, we don't sit in the same room because I come back for whatever training or and every night there's, a, there's football and or if there's no football, I'll be watching the darts. So I have to go into a different room. I'm always, whatever it is, it's some sport. It'll be darts, football, golf, snooker, whatever, tennis, I'll always be watching sports, so she hates that, but I've always been like sport-driven and football being the main one. Is that something you think's missing, obviously, society now, social media, PlayStations, Xbox, even now in my street, I don't really see any guys play football anymore. Um, do you think that's, do you, it's still, still one reason why Scotland are really doing well and that's we're playing all right, but do you think that's maybe something that in the future, you might see decreasing. There's a lot of Scottish talent because of, that's not happening anymore. hundred percent. I remember about two, or three years ago, I just drove back. I was up the road actually. And I was. I thought I'll just drive back to this flats where I used to play just to see what's going on there. There was nobody. There was nobody out there playing. There was. There was nobody doing it. Nobody out there playing football. It was. It was like a ghost town. And I think that's like you touched on society with iPads computer games don't get me wrong I used to love playing uh, football manager at times but that was it uh, I'd go and football manager at like 12 at night when I finished playing football do you know what I mean we'd, we'd go in then and be up till like 3 in the morning but when I could be outside playing I would be outside playing football but you don't really you don't really see it even down here as well where I, where I moved to England it's just completely like a different world through when we were growing up because not only was it me, it was six and seven or eight of my mates as well at the exact same time, but you don't you don't see it anywhere. And I think the biggest thing with that is technology and computers and iPads. It's we said we'd never give my daughter an iPad, but it keeps her quiet now at meals, so she's got an iPad through on her face. And we're probably the ones to blame the parents who used to grow up doing different things, we're doing different things now for our own kids. But I think that's what you said, it's society and it changes, doesn't it? I think JP like Barry says, it's something that I think true that when you were younger, you came to school, you had your, you had your gold night to your impulse on, you were bogging. It was in playing football, you're mobbing straight for dinner. No, I'm, I'll get it later. You were come in, doing your next one, play your pals again. Like uh, Barry says, JP, you, you don't see that at all anymore. No, no, definitely no. I mean, long gone are the days. I mean, I, I was getting funnies never about school, like just left, right, and centre because I wouldn't tell my mum, I'd be told my, I'd be like, right, I'm changed out playing football. <laughs> and you disappear, and some nights your mum used to have to turn to back. I love them all that. You're away playing that part, about three schemes away for you, you know what I mean? And your mum had to come searching for you. 
on the way back in, there is no mobile phones and what there is now for like to try and keep tabs on people now. But um no, long gone the radios, mate. It's very far and few between do you see like young boys or even get well last season men into football now and the way back when I was growing up, mate, last year never played football. Well, no, I remember it. It's all organised now, isn't it, as well? If you want to kick yeah. about, it's all, I'll meet you doing the five-a-side goals and all that. But I just used to go outside and everybody congregated because we're all doing the same things. But it's mental now. It's as if it needs to be organised to get a kick about now when I, I hear yeah. the people doing it. It's all, we'll book the court or we'll do this, we'll do that. But back in my days, you just go out the street and you'd find people. There's always somebody out there yeah. playing. So you would either play long shooty or whatever. You would just, or you would go to another scheme and, you'd find boys there and end up playing against them. But well, that's it. And we, like, we, we just make up games like two a side and a goalie or three a side or a game of crosses and you don't Aye. just come digging in goals and Aye. just things like that. And then see when you started getting tired with your legs and all that, we used to, we used to just get a game of Kirby. Aye, Kirby, aye. <laughs> Throw it in a bus, you get 20 points. Not really, but <laughs> I, remember, I remember my wee mate found a bus one day just being pure stupid, man. He was that tired. He'd done that. He was shy of the ball. And just decided to go bang. The ball was rock hard, man, and just went right through the bus one day. I was like, oh, no, man, it caused a big ruckus at the back of eight at night, man. Oh, street was it? I was like, oh, no. I oh, didn't know what to do. That wasn't me, that was somebody else. I was like, the boy in that That must have happened every night in Easter. <laughs> every night, hi. Um, we're just about. That's how all the motors went about when they went with the windies done, because <laughs> some of them, some of them weren't just putting their windies down, some of them didn't actually have windies. <laughs> I think these were the first motor, they were soft top, but it wasn't really that soft, it was just the, just the effect the motor had on it. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's, uh, I think it is a detriment to, obviously, the Scottish game, but obviously... I will also we'll touch on your, your Scotland career, but Scotland has got some good players. Um, See, obviously, I, I, I've, I've read Barry what started off at Celtic as youth. Um, did you ever think you would ever play with Celtic fully, or did you ever have that idea when soon as Aston Villa popped up that you would need to go to maybe get your career a bit better as in development and kind of better as a player and as, as a man? I think looking back now, because I haven't played for him, I would have stayed there and went there. Um, but at the time, I was never ever signed with him. I was playing Sunday football for Lindsay. And at the time, Celtic were pro youth. They weren't really playing for any trophies or that. It was a time when they had just started uh, just playing for development. So I, I didn't like that side because I wanted to win trophies and I liked the just the small things like the the awards at the end of the season and that that you had at your Sunday team. I loved all that and I loved playing for cups and trying to win trophies. So that's the reason I never signed for them. But I was playing games for them on Saturdays. And I think the tipping point was my mom and dad never drove. So we were in Cote Dyke. I think we played Aberdeen or something. And you always get drove back to um, Celtic Park and the parents would pick everybody up then. I never had a lift. And um, so I was made to like, I just got left at Celtic Park and luckily I must have got to a phone box or something. I was only like 12 or 11 or 12 or something at the time. And I managed to get my sister's, I think it was my sister's a husband now, um, to come in and get his. But I was just left there at 12 and my dad went nuts when he heard that. And that was the tipping point to go to um, Aston Villa. But looking back now, I should have stayed because I think it would have been easier to play for sale if I stayed and came through the the youth than come away and have to go back kind of thing. Because obviously Celtic is for me and JP and a lot of fans is obviously the pinnacle of what you want to do but um, how did the Villa move come? Was it I see, see back then how did the scouting thing go, can I go about? Obviously now it's all wise scout and it's all kind of YouTube you can show people how Back then, did, did teams actually get a hold of your name and how did that actually go outside signing you? Well, I was at Lindsay, a kit and tilt based team, and um, they were associated with Leeds United. We had the Leeds United as badge, as our, uh, our team badge. So I first went on trial to Leeds United when David O'Leary was the manager in the, in the Champions League. I got showed around the, 
their training ground in Ellen Road and that. And I remember I was only a young boy for the court date. And I remember looking at people like Alan Smith and Olivia Darcourt and that. And, and I thought, Phew, this is unbelievable. Like, I wanted to go. But then I stayed at Lindsay again and there was an Aston Villa scout there called George Grace. And every it's, it's crazy because we used to come to Birmingham as our summer holiday for years and years before I signed for Aston Villa. We used to come to Birmingham when I was like three ages of six to like 12 as our summer holiday because we had family in Birmingham. Uh, we had some family in Birmingham and the other end of Birmingham, so we used to come down every summer. And then when Aston Villa came up, my auntie that lived down here was like, well, that'll be amazing. We can get you sorted with a house they had properties that they could put us into. A lot of people thought that I came down here and Villa put me in a house and put my mum and dad and put us into a school and that. But we, we came down and just started a life there again, basically, in Birmingham and took the chance. So I'm um, from 13 till 16, I was in school and my dad had to find a new job. He got work quite easy, painter and decorator. And then when I got to 16, I got kicked out of school because I basically had an art. I was playing for the school team on a Tuesday. I had training with Aston Villa on Tuesday night and I said I can only play the first half and I need to go. The PE teacher was trying to keep me on. So I had to like, I went mental. We had like a, no a fight, but close to a fight. A few words exchanged and that and I got basically kicked out. So Aston Villa took me in early at 16. So I had two years, like I had a year before my age group actually came in full time. I had a year on them. And then from there on, I just carried on. I, I, I did a a trial actually right at the very start when I was 13 I came down in the summer part of the summer holidays I went in two weeks at a summer camp and as soon as I'd done the two weeks summer camp they wanted to sign me straight away into the academy so I never looked back and then just gradually went up the ladders and JP the fact that he's went down there quite early on and he's played as well um, for me I think it was standing in good stead because some guys go earlier on in their career and they don't, they don't settle they don't get used to the standard and the fact that I think Barry's done that early, I, I, me personally, I don't know what Barry will think himself, but I think JP definitely helps your development going down to that standard early doors. Absolutely. To be fair, I mean, I just thought I went to Furry 12 and get left outside Shelly Park. I didn't stay anywhere near the place. <laughs> that, that, must was, uh, quite, that must have been very daunting for you, Barry. It was. It was kind of like, how do you get home? You've no money. You've, ah. I never had a phone. I never even had a phone, I don't think. I don't know how... I must have got one of the coaches to phone because I don't think I'd have got to a phone box. I think I got the manager to phone, but me telling him to phone, some, uh, you would think that he'd say, oh, I don't worry about it, I'll drop you, but I had to get my brother-in-law at the time to come in and get me. And it, it, didn't really de- it, it didn't really bother me. It was me and my mum and dad that were, that, that was it for them. They, and I think at the time... Celtic kind of took it for granted that I was a big Celtic fan and obviously just thought automatically yeah. Celtic fan obviously the club he'll, he'll sign for us um, and I think there's that's part of a time as well there Barry sorry to interrupt you mate there's part of a time as well where the, the, the Scottish football probably the grassroots didn't have the best reputation for the, for the way they treated the young boys and stuff like that so um, to be fair it, it, as Ryan says, there a second ago, mate, it was going down there is probably a different, you, you probably got a different education out of it as well, mate, sort of probably looked after better, I would guess, and obviously nurtured through probably the way you should have at that time, because to be fair, I would say probably about 20 years ago is when Scottish football really started getting serious, more serious in the young younger generation than it probably ever did before, mate. Don't get me wrong, when I went down to Aston Villa, it was night and day for what I'd seen at Celtic at the time. Um, the academy, I think Celtic was still at Barrafield at the time when I was there. Uh, and I used to train at Hamilton Palace actually for Celtic. So I went for training at Hamilton Palace to like Aston Villa, Bodymore Heath, the rain training ground. It was like night and day. Um, so it was a good decision at the time. But like I said, because I've never ever played for Celtic, it's a kind of wee bit of a regret because I reckon if I stayed, I would have came through there and probably would have had a back myself to get through and play for them that way. But I think it was harder as I went away uh-huh. to try and come back. 
Was your MD away yet, Celtic, that did come through? Um, try, I don't think so, because I, I only played a handful of games. Um, I don't think there was anybody there that actually came through and played for Celtic first team. I think they, some of them went on and played uh, elsewhere. I was with the boy Jason Marrett was at Celtic. Mm-hmm. He was with me at Lendy and he came through Lendy to Celtic. Yeah. I know he played all the way up until at reserve level and then ended up no getting a, a game at the first team, but I don't think any of them made it. No, it wasn't he? Um, I was just under Aiden McGeady's edge, I think, at the time. Ah, right, OK. Because I remember seeing Aiden in the training ground and that, and he was a one or two years older than me, I think, so I can't even really recall any of them getting on and playing, no. Because mm-hmm. over at Aston Villa, um, you played under O'Neill, Obviously, been a Celtic fan, that must have been probably a bit, a bit intimidating, knowing that you're going to be a manager of this guy. But how was he for you? And obviously, making your debut, that must have been that must have been a bit of a dream come true at that level. It was amazing because, like you said, I grew up Celtic, and I was in Seville. We never had a ticket for the game, but we went to Seville. He was a the manager then, so then you have him as your manager. It was. It was as if you were looking at God when he used to walk into the training room. It was crazy. Like, it just felt surreal. And the same thing with Stan Petrov. Like, I was obviously absolutely gutted when he left Selic because he was Selic's best player at the time, captain as well. But he came to us, so I was thinking at the same time, a bit selfish, I'm going to get to see this guy, like, who I used to idolise. Um, so it was similar. Like, Didi Agat came to Celtic as well, uh, Aston Villa as well. Uh, Chris Sutton, he came for a bit. So all these people that I'd been going and supporting and watching every week, I ended up either training or playing with them. So it was amazing. And obviously Martin O'Neill gave me my debut, which was unbelievable as well. Was he only the best thing about him, Barry? Sorry, right. What was the best thing about him, like, in the dressing room and where the players? What would you say? Like, I've heard, obviously, through the, the, the team that got to Seville and stuff like that, he just did an order about him. So when he walked into the room, everybody just... Shut up, stop doing whatever then. Was that true? Did it, was he like that? He was one of them guys that, you know, if somebody says something to you and you don't really take anything, like you just take it with a pick. When he said something good to you, it felt as if it made you feel a living fit to Do you know what I mean? If he said yeah. something like, what a baller, it used to, like, you used to get like that feeling in your stomach, you want to do it again, you want to do it again. And then I remember looking in for the outside because I was like training with him. Never really making the squads at the start, but I just used to remember the boys, the bigger players in this team, like John Carew, Ashley Young, Agbon Lahore, people like that. When they liked going out because they were young, they liked the party side of things. Martin O'Neill never took that away. He used to just say, he, I remember big John Carew, he was crazy, man. He just used to love going out. So Martin O'Neill used to say to him on Saturdays before the games, like, if you won today, John. I'll see you on Thursday, go and do what you want. Go to London till Thursday, go and do what you want. <laughs> see, he then had players going out and like dying for him because they, they knew they were getting days off. That's that's what they wanted, so they would go and do everything for it. Right. He wasn't really like tactically unbelievable. He just had a knacky people want to go out there and, and die for him. Obviously, like, you had your good pros who would come in on Mondays, but the ones who wanted to go and party, you wouldn't see them till like Wednesday, Thursday. But they were successful, I think they finished six three years in a row in the, in the Premier League and Villa would never, were never done that before. So he was just one of them guys that when he said something and it was a good thing to you, you were like, you felt the best person in the planet and he just that was just the knack he had. You see, primary guys, like you say, Sutton, Carew, Petrov. Obviously now football has even progressed even past eight players. Obviously for me, Petrov is unbelievable. But you see, primary guys, as a sta- was the standard when you played with Aston Villa? Was the standard really, really high? For what? Because obviously it's kind of you don't really know how good it is when you don't play down there. But like us as fans, we think it's good, but I think it's overrated. But see, playing with players, we can be good and training with them. Is it really t- to play at that level? Do you need to be exceptional? Aye, I would say so. When I was at Aston Villa, that group of players was unbelievable. Um, I've never really spoke I, I'm close with Stan still to this day so, but I've never really asked him about that team that got to Seville or the team that he was in at Aston Villa like, 
Gareth Barry, Milner, Downing, Young, Agbonga or Carew. I've not asked them if there was a massive difference there. I must ask them that because that'd be interesting to know. But that Aston Villa team, when I was breaking through to train, just to be training with them, the standard was unbelievable. Like, obviously, Stan was a top player anyway, so he fitted into it. And, and obviously, like, one of the best in training as well. So, But he was probably Selig's best player, so he went to Aston Villa and was arguably one of their best players as well. So I don't know if... Like we were saying, if that, that class, the Celtic team, it got to that final and that Aston Villa team, I'd need to ask Stan, but um, it was a top, top level. But that was a top Aston Villa team. They've all went, Nasser Young's went on to be Man U, won leagues with Man U, and uh, Milner speaks for itself. Gareth Barry's the best appearances in the Premier League. They were on that team, so that shows you the, that it just shows you what the, the standard was like. Yeah, John Crew was one of the top three playing Champions League and scoring against Real Madrid in the Bernabeu and that so I was lucky but I was unlucky at the same time because to try and break into that team was, was nearly impossible Is it not true that when he came to Aston Villa um, I'm sure I don't know if it was an article or it was some or it was a podcast I watched did he know come in with a total did he change the mentality of Aston Villa a total winning mentality John no Martin Lee. Aye, because he came for one in every week, didn't he, at Celtic? So he must have found it hard to settle for that sixth place, even though it was an achievement for that club at the time. When you go for one in games at week in, week out, which he was doing up in Scotland and winning trophies all the time. I know he had Leicester before it, but he still had a bit of success at Leicester. But your whole demeanour changes because you just go into games expecting to win when you're at Celtic, obviously, and then to come to Aston Villa. You're still expecting that, but you're losing some games, so it must have been hard for him. But I never settled for it. He, he wanted the best, and he said he was just unlucky that you had Ferguson's Man United, Wenger's Arsenal's, and teams like that at that time, which you couldn't really do anything about. You were just unlucky in the wrong right place at the, the wrong right time, really. And she'd be bringing the players, Barry, like he brought Stan and Didier and Chris and. Did they instantly put demands on the rest of the squad? Did they, did they bring the demands that you would have seen up here at Celtic? Is, like, and that will they win? And is that, is that what you think drove them on to finish so high in the league? Sutton definitely did, because he was more outspoken than Stan. I know Stan ended up turning into the captain, but Sutton had obviously been at Blackburn and your Chelsea's and things like that, so he'd obviously played in the Prem and he had that aura about him. Whereas Stan was a bit unknown, like we're talking about there, they, they look up here and don't really mm-hmm. acknowledge it. So Stan was a bit of an unknown player. And I was saying to everybody at Villa, I remember saying, no, he's, he'll easily play. And they're like, because they've got Barry's and Milner's and real Cokers. And I was like, he'll play for Aston Villa 100%. And he, he proved me. At the time, if he first, actually first started playing wide right, Stan, when he came to Villa at first, he was playing off the right because I think they had... Gareth Barry and Rio Coker, so they were kind of just, Martin just fitted him in just to get him in there, he didn't really play yeah. centre mid but then eventually he got used to the speed of it and he ended up playing centre mid and becoming captain but uh, they brought that stand, definitely did, he never settled for anything less, I remember he used to go nuts at half time and even in training stand was driving standards, he was always like took him a while to he had to earn it, obviously, because, like I said, he can do it as a bit unknown. Not he was, obviously, but to people down there. He was a bit unknown, but then he stamped his authority, and then, he, like you said, he brought that, that well, he wouldn't settle for anything. Even, I remember, like, you were going to Arsenal's and Liverpool's, and I think people were like, oh, we're going to... But he never settled. He wanted to win every game, no matter who they were playing against. She obviously, uh, uh, obviously, Aston Villa, you said you weren't really in the squads and you weren't really playing... Obviously, you had to go on loan. Um, was that, I think it was a derby you went to first. Um, was that you want to go and play or did they tell you, listen, go and play and then come back? Or was it your mindset, I need to go and play at this, at this level to get myself developed and basically playing first in football? It was hard because it was kind of forced because see, when you're in and around that thing, it's nice and it? you don't really want to leave it. Because I was training me like, the first team all the time so it was like good I, I was loving it and um, it kind of it was kind of robo really and it was like this will help you there because I was training but playing 20 on the reserve games 
Yeah, but I was enjoying it because I was still young and I was thinking, no, I'm loving this. I don't really want to move areas and all that. I'm like happy here. So I was kind of forced, but looking back, it was the best thing ever, obviously. I, I got lucky as well because a lot of people at that time were going to like League One and Two. My loans went to the Championship. So it was still a big league and a good standard. Um, and it brought me on loops and rounds. Obviously, I was I was quite small, so people always had the, the, um, the physical side would kill me and that. So by going out early and, and having to be physical in the championship, which it is, that brought me on for when I broke into the, the Villa team. Thanks, JP. Um, you can see the loan market is used quite a lot and I also yeah. worked a lot for Barry because... It's, it's probably helped his development as as he ended up playing with Villa on a quite a weekly basis as well. So it definitely did help his, his career. Aye, definitely. Because uh, you noticed a big difference in, in Barry for, when he went out loans David back to, to Villa. Uh, and Martin obviously put him on the team. Um, but I think it's a great thing as long as it's used properly. The loan, the loan move... Uh, I also think it's imperative that if you play for a team, like just say for talking sake, there's a lot of talk up here about Barry, Liam Scales going to Aberdeen. I think that's a bad move for Liam Scales because Aberdeen don't play the same type of football as Celtic. I think he needs to play with a team at what he pop it about and play. No go with a team at what they just the best tactic is to go route one to the big boy than he is. Um, which is which seems to be their attack. They've got good ball players in their team, but they for some reason, they, they, they just decided to go Route 1 this season. And I think that was their biggest downfall, Aberdeen. And that's probably the worst Aberdeen team I remember watching uh, my, my, in my life so far. Um, I don't know about any of you guys, but for me, Aberdeen were poor. And for Liam Scales, we're just talking about loan deals here. If he was to go there, I think it'd be a, a, a major mistake for him because Aberdeen don't play that type of football that, that Ange wants to play. So he's not coming back to the team, in my opinion, a better player. He'll be coming back probably, I don't know, probably still where he is now. He's not going to progress anywhere. So I think it's imperative that you also go to a team that play your style and obviously the team style that, that you like to play in. Because I think it could hinder you in a way in your development if you go to the wrong team that don't play to your, your strength or the team style that you play for. I think you're spot on. I think I had this conversation the other day actually about um different player but similar. Billy Gilmore going to um yeah. Norwich. I thought he's, he was getting stick from Norwich, but like you said there, you've got you go to a team that plays the same style of the club you're leaving. So when he was playing at Chelsea, they've got all the ball, they're playing football, looks a million dollars. That's what he needs to do. He needs to be on the ball yeah. in a possession based team. If you go to Norwich in the championship, no problem, probably same. Norwich have all the ball, you're going to stand out as well. But you're going to a team who are fighting to stay in the league, don't really have the ball, and you're having to defend. And when you get the ball, you're only get probably one or two options. Whereas yep. at Chelsea, you've got five, six. It's got to be mere. I think they've got better at that as well. Because when I was younger, you just get tossed out and one it wasn't there, oh, put him to a club that suits the way he plays or suits the way that we play. It was just on you go, go and, go and do what you're doing and see how you get on. If you do well, fair enough. But I think now, recently, teams are starting to send players to clubs, like you said, play the same style of football yeah. as the club that they're, they're leaving for. But I felt sorry for B Billy Gilmore because it's not to do with him as a player. He just went to a team that was struggling in a, in a, in a top league. And you wouldn't look at any Norwich player last year and think, oh, he's, he's done well. It was a hard season for them. Uh -huh. So, like he said, he would probably have been better off going to a team in the Championship, like a Fulham or a Bournemouth, who yeah. are possession-based, and he'll stand out like a sore thumb because technically he's brilliant on the ball and he needs to be on the ball. Um, so it's like you said, you need to, loans are good, but they've got to be the right loans and they've got to suit the style of play that that player is. So like you can't send a ball player to a team who's going to be struggling and a struggling team, it just won't work. They'll come back, like you said, probably worse after it. Yeah. See, when you're out in loan, Barry, um, do, do you have, like, is a dialogue between you and your parent club, like a progress meeting or like to see how you're getting on? 
again, reassess what plans they may have for you down the line or like in terms of, or do, you, do you have a meeting halfway through to even maybe even say like, like they've got a view to permanent this, so they've got to do that and they've got to take that option up, you'll not be coming back to it. Do you know that right away or do you need to see that long before that meeting takes place? No, we're doing here now, they've got loan managers now doing here, so you'll have like, when uh, we had Jacob Murphy for Newcastle, uh-huh. So Andy Obi's Newcastle's loan manager. So all the players that are out in loan, it'll be his job to go round the clubs, mm-hmm. go into the training rooms, sit with the players, speak to the manager. If they're not playing enough, why is he not playing? We might have to take him back. So most of the Premier League clubs now have got loan managers. So I think Tory Andre Foz, the Chelsea one, actually. So Billy Gilmore will probably be speaking to him, giving him feedback. Tory Andre Foz will be going to the manager. Blah, blah, blah. So it's it's quite advanced in here now where you, you go to the it's not as if on you go like you're left to do what you want, you're getting monitored and it's going back and forth with the clubs. Because even in League One, we had a boy for Wolves last season, Corbiano. He's a wide player, but we were playing the wing backs, he was playing wing back, never really suited him. Came to January, off he went, he went to MK Dons. Um and that was through the loan manager, because the loan manager wasn't happy. Um he was was they playing as much as he wanted, and when he was playing, he was playing out of position. So they called him back, sent him back out to a team that they thought was going to suit him. Um, so it's massive now for clubs. I think uh, whereas when I went out and loan, it was all the best going do what you're doing. But now it's it's monitored, and if you're not getting game time, they'll just call you back and send you it somewhere else. So it's good, good. Because we were linked, Celtic were linked with a guy. Well, that was big talk before we even got hands when it was Eddie Howe. It was supposed to be coming and. And uh, it was that Fergal Harkins from Man City. Aye. He was their sort of loan manager, wasn't he? He was actually he he was their sort of loan operative as well. So is that is that just became a big thing or has always has that always been the case? Or is it just starting to be more recognised now? No, I never really heard it until that Murphy was at us. So I would say I might be wrong, but I wouldn't say it's been in for more than a couple of seasons, probably right. five years you're talking. Um but I only heard about it when Murph was at us and Michael Hector was at us for Chelsea as well, and it was Tory Andre Foe walking about the training room. And I was like, "What? How's he here?" And he, the heck, was like, oh, he's our loan manager, so he comes and we give him feedback if we're enjoying it, and, and then he goes back to the manager. So I never really knew about it, so I wouldn't say it's been in long, but I think it's something that a lot of teams could do. We we getting in because I think they benefit from it because, like you said, then if you get the right on, you look at people like Conor Gallagher and. Mason Mount and even uh, Reese James, they went out to clubs like Wiggins, Mason Mount was at Derby, Conor Gallagher at uh, Crystal Palace. They're going to go, they've are going. they all went back and they've played. They're like main players in their team now. Uh, Conor Gallagher will probably go back and play for Chelsea next season. So mm-hmm. it just shows you if you're monitoring it and getting the right game time for them. And they're obviously good players. They're the one to be at Chelsea, do you know what I mean? But they just need yeah. to be managed correctly. If they can't get in at Chelsea they need to be managed and put to the right clubs and it just shows you if you do it right, it can benefit you. So I think, what you said, if you can get the right own move, it can be good for the player, but also for the club in like years to come. They, they can, um, can say we get into the market and buy players. Yeah, it can have happened to us as well. If you remember back to Cal McGregor going to Notch County, he played with obviously Jack Grealish at the time as well, so Grealish was on that there as well. And then Callum came back and Ronnie put him on a team. I don't know, Callum's lost it back since. So, aye, it, it does work if it's done properly, mate. You're right. So, obviously, Barry, um, a big success was obviously alone at Blackpool. Um, obviously, I've watched your podcast with Simon Ferry, and you say that was a that was a massive kind of thing for your career. Um, playing under Holloway and obviously playing with Charlie Adam as well. And how was that for you as a player? Actually, right, like, I think the thing that I, I think about the loan move is. When you're leaving maybe development or reserves, you're going to play with men week in, week out. You're playing competitive football and you might be getting beat or you might not win, but you're getting that competitive action, elbows in your face and you're getting rough and tumble. And I think that's a brilliant thing for young players to do. And it obviously what for you, because by all accounts, Holly LH and the Blackpool fans took to you as well. Uh, that was brilliant for me. That was the first time where I really felt like a first team player. Obviously, I'd been to Derby, but it's a bit different there. Um, there was a lot of big names that had, had a good careers, so it was like there was 
t- there wasn't really any togetherness at Blackpool. It was like we used to wash our own training kit. We used to um, we used to have have to wait for our food getting brought up from the stadium. And nine times at the time, by the time it got to training ground, it was cold. So nobody really ate it. We went to Subway just outside the training ground. But that brought a togetherness because there would be five and six boys going to Subway at the same time. So you're spending time with each other or like every day, you no, know, just on the training field. But that that squad was just like they were written off. They weren't meant to be anywhere near the playoffs. And me coming to Aston Villa and seeing that side of it, it then it brings you down a peg or two and it it brings you together, like you say, you are all washing kit, fighting against everything really. And um, I love that side of it because that's what I, I I was brought up like that to fight against everything um, and know how things just came to you. So when I went there, it was a perfect match for me. The manager made me feel as if I was a first team player. The boys were brilliant with me. So, and luckily, luckily enough, we get promoted that year. Um, I actually wanted to go back the following season when they were in the Prem and all the way wanted to take me, but when I went back, Gerard Tullia was the Villa manager and he wouldn't let me go. So I ended up playing for Aston Villa, which was obviously better. But I was dying to go back to Blackpool the following year because I enjoyed it that much the season before. I'd imagine in Blackpool there have been a few good nights out, but as well. <laughs> I think oh, it's it, crazy, it's, isn't it? It's, I think that's why they used to go all these Blackpool, wasn't it? Crazy, man. I, I, we, we've been there as a family ourselves as well. So when I signed for Blackpool, I think my brothers and my dad were loving it more than me. <laughs> I just think it's, I think for what we hear for obviously in Hollywood, JP, he's, he's obviously, he might not be a big massive name, but I think down south he's very well respected by the players and like Barry says, I think maybe he might, I, I, I don't know if it's the case, but he might be one of the first managers to actually create a proper club team spirit atmosphere because every, every club he's managed, they've all kind of played the same way and the mm-hmm. players always speak about them in the same manner. I've never heard them say a bad word about him, eh, Ryan, to be honest with you. He's got a big reputation down there. Uh, and he, he, he kind of brings, Barry will be able to tell his men about it. He, for what I'm hearing, he, he brings a dressing room, my little family. And I think that was quite interesting what he says as well, Barry, in terms of he's got men independent at Blackfield and maybe where he's have been before. And I think that's a big thing, mate, because I think that nowadays it's all these footballers hiding behind their images and their, you know, you, you look at Paul Pogba, he's a great example. He's more interested in what his hair looks like than what he has performing for Manchester United. And I think that was a, 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 I do think that was a big, a big side track for him, for him, that he was just more interested in his actual appearance, his self-image, and that, that hindered his, his Manchester United uh, displays, especially well, in terms of last season. Because I would say that's the worst Man United team I've seen in the last 25 years. Easy. Um... They've finished, and for a Manchester United team to finish six, and be lucky to even finish six, I think it's totally unacceptable and disgraceful. Um, but I think that's imperative now, mate. I think that you're seeing a lot of that now, and it's, it's maybe because of the, the younger ones are, are getting a luxury lifestyle rather than a, you know, having to work hard, um, having to clean boots, having to look after players, having to make sure their kits are and red. I just think that's long gone now, and it, but it, uh, as you said earlier, it's like a new generation, but I think that side of football should never have died away. I think that it would have grinded, up, it would have grinded a lot more boys, if, if that makes sense. It dep- I think a lot of it comes from how you're brought up, to be honest. Um, I think if you're given everything for a young age, it's hard to then change as you get, get older and... Yeah. If if I see a lot of people that have had to work hard growing up that make it as first team players. They cherish it and you see, you can see that they want it more. Um, they're, they're, they're no used to like getting given anything easy. So yeah, you touched on earlier. Um, wait a minute till I move out here. <laughs> um, but I used to love cleaning boots. I used to love um. We I used to work on Saturdays at the game and our kit man at Aston Villa was known as like an angry man to the young kids. Used to like, nobody could go near him. 
But because uh-huh. I used to watch it every home game because um, I loved being player when I was younger. I used to love it. Like, I'd say hello to them and that. So I used to love working at the games because I would be in that environment. Or you know, even like uh, RA Nash and Villa players, like they used to play Liverpool Man U. So I was getting to be close to like schools and they would walk past me and that. So I used to love working at the game, filling the skip, emptying the skip. But that does not happen now. Like, first team player. The, the youth team boys don't even clean boots anymore. It's all changed. Um, they probably won't move past you as well. So they're no really, whereas notice it nowadays. And I think that's the way the world is now. Um, there's a lot more uh, money in the world now and no really having to work for it because their families were rich or something like that. And when you get there, it just feels normal. Whereas if you're from a working class background, you get there and you don't really stop and you keep going and it's just the way you're brought up, I would say. Yeah. I think, I think that's, I think if you're born, obviously as in the East End, even if it's playing amateur football, you're born to battle and win the game of football. You're going up to green up to battle and you know it's going to be a battle. It's, but I do believe that, like you're saying, I think the youth generation do the loan signs they don't really do, like you say, the hard work. When you were younger, like cleaning the boots, the stones. I know maybe now it's due to health and safety. Um, I don't know if that's why they can't do it anymore, but I obviously gave you a grounding, being part of that kind of, maybe the last bit of that either, to kind of do that, the one side of it and help them in that side, the development side. Well, we used to clean boots and I, I remember I used to have, um, I got lucky really one year, I had Rio Coker and Gareth Barry. And come Christmas time, I think they gave me 500 each. Like, I was only on 90 quid a week at the time as a score. So that, like, I got a grand for two players. And I was like, at Christmas, it was the, the most money I'd ever had in my life. I was loving it. So I think it should still be in because it keeps them grounded and they get a reward as well at Christmas time. Because some of them boys are on their own mare now because it's went up again. But some of the first team players at the Premier League teams would change now because they're in there, so it'd be more than what I was getting as well. And it just keeps you grounded, I think. Keeps you level headed, I think. 100%. I think so. I think so. Especially the fact, like you say, Barry, if you're no, if you're no playing first team football, and it's kind of like you want to get to that level. Um, I, remember, well. I, re- I remember when I was breaking into the first team as well, and I played first team games. I was still in the reserve team changing room. And when I went back to the reserve team changing room, the manager used to always make sure that even though I'd played that first team game, that I wouldn't be getting carried away. And I think that was a big thing for me as well. Like, I knew what he was doing, but not at the time. So I thought he was all, I was like, going? but now looking back, it kept me grounded. And that's what needs to be done. Because you see people playing one or two games now. And that's it, they're done, they've made it. Whereas at Aston Villa at the time, I was going back and I was getting brought back down and making sure that my head wasn't going above the clouds. And then when I was getting home, it was happening as well because my mum and dad would do it and my brothers. So it's just however you, you, you're brought up, I think, plays a massive part in how you're going to be. Even you were coming back to Aston Villa, Barry, and then you go to play, did you... See, when you go on the team and you, you stood on that park, did, were you annoy that? Were you, were you like, oh no, I had to, and then, were you a bag of nerves or were you just like, no, I feel part of this, I, I deserve this and I want to be here? Because essentially you had worked all your days so far to, to, for that moment. So you must have played that moment in your head about a million times, going like, I'll try this, I'll do that bit. It just probably just came to you naturally because that's what you'd worked so hard for. I loved it. I've always been, don't get me wrong, it changed a wee bit now as I'm older, but when I was at that young age at Aston Villa, I was just always like excited to get out there and play. I never had any sort of nerves. Maybe I did and I never knew, but nothing that would stand out. So I was always looking forward to being on, so say for instance, we were playing Man U or something. I was looking forward to playing against Paul Scholes just because I, I used to watch and that was one of my heroes so I was thinking I've got a chance to play here like what? why would I be nervous about it like I'm playing if he's better than me he's better than me so what like it's expected do you know what I mean so I was just excited more than anything to try and go and show that I deserve to be there but at Aston Villa I never really 
I, I was always going on the park thinking that I had to prove a point because I'd never felt mm-hmm. settled there. Do you know what I mean? I always felt as if I was going out having to prove a point because at the time when I went there, they were used to success. But as I broke in, we started to like drop because all the good players started to leave. So we were having a wee bit of a downward spiral, which was hard for the fans to take. So I was always going on to the park knowing that I had to prove a point because they were used to like Gareth Parry's, Milner's, Ashley Young's. And then I was coming through like with a younger generation. So it was a kind of turn for the club at the time. And it was hard. It was hard, but it was something that I look back and when I'm finished and it was one of the best times in my career. I was playing at Villa Park in front of 40 odd thousand fans in the Premier League against some of the best players in the world. See as well, you went to Leeds as well on loan. Um, I know you played with Snowgrass as well. We all know he's a, he's a wind up merchant as well. Um, see Leeds as a club. Um, is that as I, I don't know if you played a lot for Leeds, but are they a, is that a massive club, Leeds? They are massive. They are a big, big club. Um, I've been quite lucky really in a way that I've played at a lot of big fan base clubs even now. Sheffield Wednesday are massive. Um, I didn't know that, obviously. Like, I just went there at the time, not knowing that, but now I've been there for seven, eight years now. They're massive as well, bigger than a lot of people actually think. Um, Leeds United, another one of them, but they're well known that they're a, they're a big club. But um, touching on something we spoke about earlier, like speaking about Jota and Carter Vickers going to Celtic and taking Tate straight away and thinking, well, this is... Um, massive. Uh, that's the reason I've stayed at Sheffield Wednesday for so long is because of the fans. Because um, once you get a connection with your fans, it's you can have all the money in the world, but if you've got that love for the fans, that's massive mm-hmm. for me. That's mm-hmm. something that draws me. If the fan base that you're playing for take to you, singing your song every week, you go out for food, they're up speaking to you. It's hard to leave that, and that's how I think so many people have stayed at Celtic for so long as well. And is it better? Has it became more enhanced that sort of fans approaching you since you became a captain? Um, I think when we get relegated and I stayed in League One, um, made that bond even stronger. But I've been lucky that from my first season onwards, because we got to play our final my first year there, and I had a good season. Ever since then, they've just took to me and it's there's been no looking back. So I've had chances, obviously, to leave. But like I said, I'm one of these people that I'm in football to, win, to try and win things, first and foremost. And then I love having a connection with the fans and they've uh-huh. took to me. And it's a massive fan base as well. So when you've got that many people singing your name, there's no much things in probably life that, Feel better than that. Yeah. Is it, I think I think you're right, mate. When it comes off, I've no played at your level, but I think you must be right. If the fans love you, it must be an incentive to stay. Because obviously, like I think for for us, anybody as a fan, will Jota get the love that he gets at Celtic anywhere else? Probably not. Oh. Um, and the fact that he's got maybe six games, blockbuster games at least next year in the Champions League. Apart from your top teams like Barcelona and Real Madrid, where are you going to get that in the, in the fan base? It, it must be, like you say, it must, it must be in these players' minds when they're talking to their agents and they're talking to the, the clubs that I'm loved here. It must be, he said they're getting an extra five grand a week. That extra 5,000 fan love, that must play a part in it. They won't understand it, though. That some of the agents won't understand, because no, I don't know who his agent is, probably foreign. He won't um, understand that. Sam Mendes. I think, is Mendes, it? I think so, I. Like they, they, they won't understand that of because he's he'll be the only person that'll be able to understand that. Do you know what I mean? Because he's getting it. But like you said, that love's complete. It's different to money. Like it's it's different. Like you can have all the money in the world. It doesn't mean you're happy. Do you know what I mean? But mm. when you're out on that park and you get fans like that singing, uh, no doubt he goes out in Glasgow. Can he move? Gets hounded with Celtic fans. And it's just all love. It's it's the best feeling in football. Um, and like you said, where where is he going to go? That's got a bigger fan base than Celtic at this minute in time. He's probably not going to get as a bigger a fan base than Celtic like at yeah. this minute in time in his career. So 
I think this me speaking personally, if it was me at 100 percent stay at a club that's got fan base like that, they're winning trophies, they're in the Champions League. He's still young, so he's got time if he really wanted to go and kick on. But he's to be honest, he's had one good season at Celtic, so he probably needs to go and date again for another season or two, and then maybe he might get the, the bigger clubs. But at the minute in time he probably goes to a middle of the road Premier League team who you're talking like Southampton's or something like that is that worth worth that than staying at Celtic in front of 60,000 playing in Champions League no way Jota's probably experiencing something similar to that in the body because well, on social media we're seeing on the half season everywhere he's went he's been in New York Cyprus high beef with the boys and then he's he's in Mexico the new Coco Bongos the other night here. and everywhere he's went he's had thought he's taking the Celtic fans and he's probably been like oh, wow man I can't escape this and it doesn't help either when he's walking about New York, wanting a kick about the boys, and he's got a select up on his <laughs> So I've that. said to Ryan before, I don't think he's in any hurry to, to escape the memory of Celtic or, you know, normally with loan signings, you, you don't really kind of, you don't really kind of see that. Usually the luck we've got the loan signings, they'll come and then they'll, they'll spend a year and play out their skin, they'll do well, and then we just kind of get the deal out, done here and put it out of the line, and then the... You know, he moves on to pastures new, but that's my next question for you. See, see, in terms of your representatives, ever looks after you and stuff, your agents and stuff, is it they that drive the deal or do they come in dialogue with you and then you say, No, get that done, I want that done now or whatever? Is, is that how it works or is it the agent that deals with everything? It depends what agent you've got really, doesn't it? Right, um, okay. I'm lucky with my agents that Lee Matthews is my agent, he used to play up for Livingston and that um, he's Snoddy's agent so he's same background as me so the players he probably takes on his clientele are like similar backgrounds because that's the way he wants to go about it and uh-huh. he's not an agent that would be way you for the money like if he was one to me to, to make money for his sale you'd have been wanting me to move mm-hmm. but he's been adamant um We'll just tell Cubs no because I've been saying I'm happy where I am. Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Um, so it depends what agent you've got, but I'm lucky that I've got a good agent that um, he'll, he'll, he goes with what the player wants. Um, he'll have agents that will push the deals because they're getting their pockets full. Do you know what I mean? That's just the way football is. But if you get the right agent, then they'll leave it to the player and it's up to the player. But like I said, Looking for the outside, I think it'll be hard for Jota to turn Celtic down this season, um, even if it's back on loan and it doesn't get done permanent. But I don't think he'd be jumping about New York and stuff with Celtic taps on if he wasn't coming back. <laughs> I, I also mentioned that to Ryan, mate, as well. I thought that, that by now, the Scottish media will have nothing more than sticking about it as whenever they can. So normally they would have snippets see what was going on. And if he wasn't coming, then I think they'd be they'd be trying to stick about on it is and slagging his half and and we've not seen any of that yet. We did me either with Carter Vickers either. So and then obviously Carter Vickers has been announced now. So we're just now playing the waiting game with Jota. I think the Carter Vick, for me the Carter Vickers one was more important than any anyone to be honest. I thought he was Celtic's best player last year. Obviously, he doesn't have today a lot because we were dominating games, but. In the big games, the old forum games and that, I thought he was brilliant and I thought if you needed to get anybody out of them two in and permanent, it would have had, I'd have took Carter Vickers first because I think you can maybe put Kyogo out there or Aye. you've got Abada, Maida and Jack and Marcus. I just don't think you can lose Carter Vickers because like, where do you go if you go with him? Do you know what I mean? Aye. No, I agree, mate. I, I, I think we've said it, JP, that I think maybe it's it's really beneficial for Starfield that Vickers is there because they yep. two have got a very, very, as much as I think Big Julie is still a good player, I think when he looks at favourites going you know, on, he's not happy, he's wanting games, obviously in football, Barry or no, if you don't get games eventually, you need to go to pass or do. But yeah. I don't think we can let Julian go unless you bring somebody else in. But I think that um, Barry's right, cause I think I've seen Barry's tweet about Vickers signing, it was a brilliant, brilliant signing and I agree. I think he's been solid and I don't know what you think, Barry. Obviously, you know the standard down there and how good the Premier League is, but for me, you could easily walk into a Brighton, it says, from playing a border. Well, a lot of people, like, 
he speak Connor Goldson, I know Connor Goldson well. I've played with him. I've been a few holidays. I've bumped into him in holidays. He's he's played for Brighton um as well in the in the Premier League. He's another one that could probably go down to England and play for teams like that. Just it's just, it's like you say, it's because they're up here playing up here that they're like, I oh, he can't play in the Premier League. He's been at Tottenham, he's not really played, he's went to a few teams in the championship. But what people forget is because they went to the championship and went back to their club and no played, he's like he's at Tottenham, do you know what I mean? They're a, they're a top team. It sometimes just doesn't work out. Um but then you'll get like Mason Mount who went to the championship, played, went back and then got in. It's just right place at the right time. And I think, well, he strolled most of the games last season. I thought, um, even though for home games he was brilliant. So I think, like you said, he could easily play for a Premier League team easy. In my opinion, Barry, for Carter Vickers, I, I, you see Premier League games on the telly. I, I tend to... Um, Try and avoid it to be honest. I'm, I'm all about Scottish football and all the rest of it, but for what I've seen and what I see in snippets and stuff like that, I've got the luxury of seeing Cameron every week now because he's up the road, he's up here, and we see him all the time. I think he's everything in a modern day centre back teams are looking for in the modern day. He, he's strong, he's good in the air, he's good with the ball, he just does everything calm and he simplifies everything, he doesn't do anything stupid. For me, in my opinion, Barry, I don't know what you think yourself, mate. I actually think he's better than Eric Dyer. And he gets a game for Tottenham. In my opinion, I think Cameron brings a lot more to the table than Eric does. If he's not wanting to go up and argue with fans in the stand, then he's, you know what I mean? He's, he's more interested more than everybody else for what I see. But I don't know what Eric Dyer brings to the table. I really don't. Different for, for what, what Cameron Carter Vickers could. That I can't understand him. personally. I spoke to George Byers, he plays for us, he's a big Rangers fan, um, massive Rangers fan actually, so he's been getting battered this season after me when we go in. Uh, I mean Josh? Aye, uh, well when that kid Johnny is, he's not really, he kid Johnny is, he just for all pub- he just for publicity on that Twitter, he kid Johnny, he's, no, okay. he's not a Rangers man. Um, oh, is he, but, he's no? Did you no, say? well, <laughs> he left in bad terms, didn't he, he get chopped out basically. Aye, Aye. Uh, Pedro sort of, I think he'd a bit of thought, didn't he? I don't know what happened, but he just you know it never ended the way he wanted to. So he when he's tweeting about Rangers, he's he doesn't mean it. I don't, I've had loads of arguments about it with him. Right, okay. But so he's got a lovely savvy type of hanging kids on, he knows what he means and he doesn't aye. Aye. <laughs> he says what the Rangers fans want to hear. Aye. <laughs> um but Byers, he's a massive like, Rangers fan, massive. Um he played with Carter Vickers at Swansea and Obviously, Carter Vickers being at Celtic, they're still good mates. And he he could easily say, he's, but he said Carter Vickers, he's top. When he was with him at Swansea, he said top, top player. And yeah. he's played with good players. Um, and he seemed to think that he's... He was saying to me as well, because I was saying Carter Vickers is the best centre-back in Scotland. Uh, and he said the same. When a lot of people would probably go for Goldson, but I think Carter Vickers is top well, defender. I, 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 I think Vickers is... Again, oh, I, I know you I know obviously your pal away, um Connor Barry, but I think um because is I, I agree with you, I think he's I probably see he's maybe part of the denier, maybe to Van Paul Van Dyke, I think he's probably the best we've had in a long time. He's been Van brilliant. Dijk. He's he's been brilliant. Um the two of them the two of them are better than a lot of defenders in the Premier League this season though that I've seen as well. Mm. The two of them are mm. better than a lot that are playing in the Premier League this year. So you could have a case for either of them to get in there and play in the Premier League easy. What I think commendable about Big Goldson is the fact that what he's been through, he had to go through heart surgery and all that, and then I think he's played every game for him. I don't even think he's, he's never injured. He's, he plays every every game. He, he makes himself available for every game, and I think that's astounding for a guy that plays that position where you're asked to tackle quite a lot, you're asked to put your body on the line, and he's he's available every single game. You never see him dropping the wee nickels or and he's he's quite hard as well in the challenge. Um, even the even the cup games he's they play every game. They, yeah. they were dropping some players last year, he plays every game and especially like you said after that big operation in that as well. It's unbelievable. Uh-huh. He's a he's a good guy and he is he's a good defender. Mark one of my cousins is a Rangers fan. And he was um he was adamant that he was going to go. 
I think probably them getting to the Europa League final under the new managers probably swayed him to stay because I think he had he was out of contract and I think he could have he could have walked into a few Premier League teams probably if he wanted to and he's decided to stay. So the strong rumours up here in the tabloids, Barry, I don't know if you've seen it, but apparently not in Forest were ready to take him. I've seen that um, Forest and Bournemouth apparently were all over him. Um, uh-huh. And he but we've, we've this, actually spoken about this, Barry. We just didn't know why he left it the way he did. His contract ran out and then decided, right, I'm going to sign. Because it, it kind of looked like he played his last game. It did. He probably just waited to see what it was like after Gerard, because... He probably enjoyed it that much. He'd just won his first league title. Uh-huh. Um and he was probably thinking, like, I've done it here now, do you know what I mean? I'm like and then he's he's waited for that new manager. He's probably took to him and enjoyed the new manager and thought I'll get another go. It's like I said earlier, Lynn, it's the same on the other side. Once you get love for them fans, it's a hard thing to throw away. Yeah, I definitely I think a lot of them got a rude awake this season though, as to because at the beginning of the season, even with the press, the media and everything up here, they thought they were going to canter that this season. Oh. They thought they were going to run away with that league this season. That part this season passed. And they got totally schooled when they came to Park Kid in the 2nd of February. Total, and there was a gulf in the squad. You could see it. And even in, you look at the, the two halves, first half, you like, bluttered them. It should have been about six or seven going at half time if it wasn't for McGregor. Um, and even in the second half, in my opinion, the second half was a tactic for Ange. It was to sit off, use, don't use, have used a lot of energy, don't use a lot of energy, sit off, give him the ball. When they come into your half, we'll start closing them. They let him have the ball, he popped the ball, but they thought Ryan Jack was our best player. He had the ball in his own half. I'd have looked like the best player in the part if I'd have <laughs> the ball in my, And I'd, I'm not being rotten, do you know what I mean? And you've probably played with Ryan yourself, Barry, but he had the ball in his own half. He could have played keep it up for about half an hour, maybe we didn't need him. See, like, sat off him, let him play, and then when they came into our half, we just shut him down, and they just didn't have an answer. They could not, they'd have played that, they'd have been still playing the other noon, still when they scored that night. Um, ah, look, if you're a football fan, the game was finished, it was finished at half time, so yeah. you don't, it always happens in football, like you, like you said, that they were passing the ball, but say, like, were letting them, they weren't hurting us, they, I think they had the crossbar for 30 yards, that was their only real. Yeah, chance that night, but the game was done and dusted. So you'd save energy for the the, the, the game at the weekend. Obviously, the yeah. game was done. I got a, I got a question on Twitter bar as well. For, uh, obviously, put you put you on. A guy asked, "Was there was rumours about you coming in orders with you to Celtic? Was that true, or is that just media talk?" There's, I think it was the it was, the closer come was when Rogers left and Lennon was there, right? And Lenny came in because I had Lennon at Bolton. And um, that was the closest, but I, we couldn't get it out of the line. Obviously, I was still at Sheffield Wednesday, and it just never materialised. There was rumours, but nothing really strong enough to go it. How how was Lennon at Bolton? Um, I know he, I know he was. I think he was quite keen to take you there. How was he a man? Because obviously, be, there's a lot of obviously bad kind of press from the last year. But I still say it was. You can't discount one bad year, bad one bad season. Because you made it was a brilliant player, Champions League trophy at Celtic. One bad year doesn't for me it doesn't deteriorate what I think if it was a manager. How was he for you? He was brilliant. Obviously, I looked up to him because he was part of that Martin O'Neill team. Um, and then he won trophies as the manager as well. So to work under him was similar to Martin O'Neill, really, but no as big as that. Um, I got on with him really well. He was quite similar to Martin. In a way, he kind of took bits from Martin, obviously having him at Leicester and then Celtic. So he was good. I liked him. Um, and like you touched on there, probably people look at last season, we finished 20 odd points behind Rangers and they won the league and, and blame him. But there was a lot of things that went on there, like COVID and they went to Dubai and all that. It was, the, it was just a shambles, really. So you look back and blame him I don't think you really can blame him I think he might for the the, the outside looking in he probably it looked as if he lost a few players mm-hmm. and they kind of gave up really but I, I, I find it astonishing that Celtic fans can 
try and slag him after what he's done, player and manager. Because obviously as well, um, Scotland, Barry, um, I'd like to think as a, maybe as a professional, it's maybe the pinnacle of your career, obviously, um, playing with Champions League, etc. would be brilliant, but I think playing for your country, even if it's only five minutes or like yourself, 27 gaps, major debut, 2009, I think, 2010, sorry, the Pharaohs, that must have been, it must have been amazing. I don't know how you'd have felt, because for me, even getting five minutes for Scotland would be a dream come true. So for yourself, and the players under Gon Stratton, Clay Levine, you played with some top players, and obviously England, that, and you mean England, that, to be involved in that kind of calibre of football, it must be phenomenal to have it under your belt. That was amazing. I loved him. Um, you always, you, there was times, not so much now, where you would, when I was playing for Scotland, there would be call offs, and there was a lot of call offs in international football at the time. It was a strange period where people just didn't really want to go for whatever reason. I don't know, but I just, there was sometimes I wasn't even in the, I wasn't in the provisional squad one summer. Stratton, I wasn't in it, and then somebody pulled out. I got called up, went away and trained, and ended up starting in the game against Croatia because I'd done well in training under Stratton. And I wasn't actually named in the squad, so I just used to love going away because you get bored of your club teammates. Now and again, like you're around them all the time, and that. But that was a different environment. Players for everywhere coming, and it was just good banter. Different Scottish and Scottish people as well, and we all get we all get on and all get the same kind of banter and get get each other. Whereas at your club level, like, there's all different nationalities and that's, it's, it's different feeling. I used to love going away with Scotland because we were all the same. Um, just love messing about in that as well. Um, but like you said, it's a huge honour, obviously, growing up as a kid as well. You want to play for your country and I was lucky to do that. Um, so... Like I said, sometimes I got lucky because I wasn't even in the squads and just got called up right I'm away, 100%. Like I could have been on holiday, I'd still come back and go and play for your country because it's the it's the biggest thing in football, really, uh, playing for your country. And that's something that I look back in as well. When you're doing it, it doesn't really hit home, I think. That's a lot of things in football. You, it goes past you without you really taking it in. And I think when you look back, when you're finished, you'll be like, that, that was actually mm-hmm. unbelievable, do you know what I mean? But... I think a lot of footballers will say the same thing. These things that are all happening, they're happening so quick, you don't really get a chance to take it in because you're kind of on to the next thing. Frank as well. Seven years were away together. You put under Gorn Strachan and all, mate, and we all know, I think roughly Barry, I think Barry will be able to tell once you speak to JP, I think that was a time where the media up here were calling for the Celtic players to start getting involved as well. With Scott Brown to play more, McGregor, Griffiths, and by all accounts, Gordon Strachan was super for Celtic. I think from, from my Scottish fan opinion, he was good for obviously Barry and good for Scotland mm-hmm. at that time. Sorry, JP. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, I was just, I was just a look, Bonnie, just being a nice with you, just says there, uh, Ryan. Um, I'm just about to say to Barry, when, when you were away with Scotland, was that a big thing? Was that talky? Because uh, I know as a fan watching, it was certainly a lot of talk among the fans. Like, a lot of Celtic players don't get picked for the Scotland team. Why is that? Why is it? Is that, was it a big thing in the camps? But no, really, because I think with Stratton, the team that I was in, I don't think Stratton really got much rang team selection. I think Scott Brown played anyway because he was... He was Stratton's captain. Aye. Yeah, because Dan Fletcher got that illness at the time as well, so he wasn't really playing. Scott Brown was playing. And then you had James Morrison, who was playing every week in the Premier League, who I thought was very underrated. Um, He was a top player. Top, top player he was. um, And then sometimes it was either James McArthur or... I can't remember who else played in the middle. I think it was J- between Jamesy, sometimes Charlie Adam was in and around it. Uh, you? I, <laughs> it. I was. I normally played wide on the striking, so I never really right. played in the middle, but I don't think he really get much rang, to be honest, in my time there. Uh, Griffiths was in and out, but we had Stephen Fletcher as well, who was 
was playing in the Premier League. He's one of my best mates. So he was a he was a top player as well. Obviously, when Griffiths played, he done well with the England and that. But uh, I thought Stratton was brilliant for Scotland. I think he got sacked harshly as well. I know we missed it, but what a lot of people are forgetting then was we were playing against like three and four good teams in the group, whereas the teams now that are getting there, they're qualifying through the nation league where it's you're playing teams in and around you like the same level as you. Whereas yeah. when we were trying to qualify, we had Germany, Poland, like Slovakia's in our group, and you had to finish first to go through and then second to be in the, the playoffs. It was it was hard back then. Um and I think he was unlucky. We we just missed out. I think we could have qualified and we drew two each with Slovenia. That was one of my last games, I think. I think if we won that game we were we were there. But I thought he'd done a good job and he was I thought he was actually done by. Um at the time I thought and he was starting to bring your John McGinn's in. They were still young at the time. That's what a lot of people people are saying they overlooked them, but he never really they were young. They were mm-hmm. just coming through like McGinn, Cal McGregor. He started to play Stuart Armstrong. That was one of the midfielders actually who started to play. He played in the England games and that. He loved Stuart Armstrong. So if he was still in the job, Stuart Armstrong would have been playing all the time. He he really liked Stuart Armstrong. I remember that. Still gets a lot of stick for that. Boy gave away against England. Ah <laughs> uh, no, the two each game. Um, <laughs> but no, he was Stratton was the one that integrating them. They were in the squad, Jim McGinn's and that. They just weren't mm. the hoarding doing a place, but they were the new guard ready to come in. Aye. And see, part of that Scotland team, mate, obviously, you, you, you said a good camaraderie, but what showed it even more was the FIFA videos you were involved with. So what kind of brought that room? Was that your ideas as players or was that the, 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 the Scottish FA that, that brought that in? It was the F, the Scottish FA that the, the, um, obviously picked the players and they knew that me and Fletch were close and Snoddy and Robbo were close and we were quite loud around the, the hotel and around the training ground and that so they kind of had a gist for who they could throw in front and it, it would right. it would go down well so me, Fletch and Snoddy were close and Robbo was just part of Snoddy's crew because Snoddy was the lively one so Snoddy grabbed I don't think Robbo wanted to be there to be honest he's more quiet and a wee bit witty but Snoddy basically bullied him to come and do it but they um he was mental. He would he was just involved in everything, Snoddy. Um it's got to be one of the best. I was in tears watching these man. I swear to God, but try to play FIFA and he's just lighting his up. But that's what it would be like in the rooms every night. Like it just happened to be that that got filmed that night, but that's what it was like. It was just constant that we had. Right. He was he's just nuts. He used to tip rooms up and nobody knew who it what they could, but he was a good liar, so he would be speaking deadly serious and you're starting to then question, was it him? But I knew it was him. But like, I was starting to question myself, thinking, is it him? Because he's just got, a, he's got like, he can do anything really. He can prank. He's the pranks are unbelievable. I don't mind. I know. Was it he phoned the guy and he was was it Greg's father or the young youngs or something? Oh, I, was fe- was it, it's yeah, I was Fenners, wasn't it? Aye, Fenners. Fenners he done Fenners. Aye. <laughs> he was opening up a new shop or something. He wanted them. He was getting them or the young youngs or something. It was mental. He's, man. He's done loads that people are questioning now because he's come out. But he's done loads of people that still don't know to this day that it was him that done it. All right. So okay. if I get an unknown phone call now, I'll be thinking twice. I'm always unknowns. I always think twice about them because I think it could be him. It's him. Trying to wind me up. <laughs> Obviously, you're still chef of Wednesday now, Barry. Um, how would you kind of look back on your career um, so far and... Um, Going forward, what was your goals be going forward? Was, was coaching never be involved or you know thinking that until you maybe retire? To be honest with my career so far, I reckon I could have done a lot better. Uh, no through the, the, the will of trying because mm. I, I give my best every day, but I just think right place, right time sometimes. I could have got a few more uh, lucky breaks. Um I've, I've, my, me and my dad speak about it quite a lot you, everybody's got their own path and this is the path for me I've enjoyed every minute of it um, I'm lucky and feel privileged to be at a big club like Sheffield Wednesday still but looking back I reckon I could have probably stayed around the Premier League a bit longer and probably played for Scotland a bit longer but with a little bit of luck 
on my side, but um, I'll never look back with regrets. Maybe the only regret is that I never obviously get the chance to play for Celtic. I'll always, that'll always hurt me till the day I die. But um, going forward, coaching 100%. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm fit boys my life, so I'll definitely look to manage one day and hopefully I'm lucky enough to manage at a, at a good level. But it's something that I'll do even if it, doesn't it? Even if I don't become a professional manager, I'll always be in and around football, grassroots or whatever I can, or academies or whatever. But like I said, football is my life, so even when I'm finished as a player, I'll, I'll be involved in football somewhere. So I think for me, JP, I think Barry's giving himself a bit of the service, saying that he could have done better. He's done better than me, mate. You know what I mean? He's done better than a lot of guys who have no played professional football and... Play, play the Premier League, play for Scotland. There's no really much more, mate. In my opinion, that you could obviously win trophies, but the level he's played at and the players he's played with, the clubs he's played with, it's a phenomenal career. Still, he's still got a long, I'll say at least maybe three or four years at the top level, JP. Aye, definitely. You tend to find the, the, the really good modern pros, Brian, um, they're always modest when they're asked that question about their careers and, you know, their where they think they could go and what they could do because deep down they've probably set goals for themselves to to be better all the time so you, you want to always self-improve and as a footballer mate I'd imagine you're never happy until you, you you're always setting goals so just say one season you might not hit that goal then it drives you on for the following season to maybe you start thinking about pre-season you go right was I not fit then did that happen did that happen did I, did I no stay an extra hour that day at training? Did I know? You start thinking about games. Did I know hit numbers that game? Did I know? So things start running about. And I think that's brilliant. A lot of pros need that in them, I think, to, to be successful. But with Barry playing for Scotland and playing around boys who have played in really good dressing rooms, with Barry's been in good dressing rooms himself, uh, it comes part and parcel, mate. It becomes your day to day. Activity, you just want to be better all the time, man. But he's had a great career, and there's there's, there's no taking that away for Barry. Um, but obviously, he's Barry probably has that wee bit of not, I wasn't happy there, or not, I wasn't happy there, or not, I wasn't happy there. And I think most players nowadays uh, would probably say the exact same thing, mate. I, I, I think so. Um, I think if at the level you, at Barry's playing it especially as a captain, so he was driving the team on every day and obviously Barry only to set the demands when the captain as well, so I think to be the level Barry's played at and the guys he's played with, I think you've got to have that mindset. Again, that's maybe why guys like me and you and guys who I know got plenty to watch Celtic, didn't he make it? Yeah. Um, but obviously Barry, it's been a pleasure to speak to you, mate. It's been like speaking to one of the boys just to be even talking because it's been superb, mate. Um, probably kept him in there I'd like to, because I know you've got a family <laughs> and kids, mate, but um, I know you're getting married at the weekend, mate, so the fact you've taken your time out to just speak to two guys for Eastern and Glasgow, mate, it's been amazing, mate, and again, take care, mate, and hope the wedding goes well at the weekend. Well, yeah, it's been a pleasure being on. If you need any help by any players or that, that you can think of, he's a shout, and I'll, I'll put in a good word and try and force them your way. <laughs> no, honestly, um, any, help, any help be amazing, mate, but the fact that you've come on and helped us, mate, and Spoke to you about your career. It's been amazing for us to hear about your career. And again, though, I keep you too long, mate, because I know we've got a yeah. family and kids. But um, no problem. Help, I'll, get a, take care. I'll get a retweet on that on Twitter and that and as well to try and get a wee bit of push when he's right. No, it's worries, been Barry. a total pleasure speaking to you, mate. All the best. And you, JP, hope, mate. Cheers, hope Saturday goes, goes well. Yeah, man. Cheers, hope mate. if you don't mind, I'll keep in touch. <laughs> of course, I Tweet away. I'll give you my number after this. Right, right cheers, okay. mate. No worries, Barry. Thanks, cheers. Man. You need me, all right? Cheers, Barry. Okay, thanks, mate. See you later. See you. Bye. Bye-bye.